Hey everyone, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Cerulean Arts. And Canfield is on the way in, so we'll get started. Um, it's been quite a difficult week, so we're happy to end the week with the artist tour and talk of the current exhibition, Tell Me a Story, uh, featuring the work of Anne Canfield, Mikhail Alam, Barbara Mimna, and Clarissa Shanahan. So thank you to the artists for, uh, for being in the show. It's a, a narrative theme show. So all, uh, judging by the title, tell me a story. So we, uh, you know, everything has a, like a narrative quality to it, but very different. So uh, what we're gonna do is do a walkthrough of the exhibition and then we're gonna stop at uh, different points and have the artists uh, speak about the work that uh, you see. So I just want to make sure that everyone sees Tina's The Cerulean Arts video is the largest video for you in your view. Okay, that's great. We're getting better at the zoom in every time we, we do it. One day we'll be back uh, to having in-person events. We look forward to that. Um, in the meantime, the gallery, we still have our regular hours, so you can always come down and visit the show. Uh, we're open Wednesday through Friday, 10 to 6, Saturday, Sunday, 12 to 6. And uh, we limit the occupancy to, to 10, and every, anybody who comes has to wear a mask. So you can definitely come and see it in person if that's uh, something you'd like to do. So um, the first group of work that we see. We have two Barbara Mimna paintings and the one Anne Canfield in the middle. Um, Barbara, maybe you could start and talk a little bit about uh, yourself and your work that we see. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> well, uh, let me see. I um, studied illustration in art school many years ago, so right off the bat I was doing uh, telling stories. Uh, so this one I'll get into. I have certain themes, I guess, that I have always worked with over the years, and they may sound unhappy. Threat to happiness uh, is one of them. Uh, upsetting the order of things, that's another. And uh, at the same time, I try not to be too heavy-handed about it, but to, to bring a certain comedy into it. And I think this one is probably a good painting to begin with, because that, that kind of uh, sums up uh, what, my, what my general themes are. Sometimes I get a little happier and, and don't go this way, but, but this one, uh, which was just done really this this uh, time during COVID. So I may have been feeling a little more threatened than usual, which accounts for my uh, barking, chasing dogs and babies running away and twisted heads and all of that. So that, that about tells that. You're working with acrylic? Barbara? That's an acrylic. Most of them are acrylic. I think there's one here that is in oil, but, but most of them are acrylic. And uh, this one, um, this paint, I, I've spent a lot of time in, in Italy over the years. Uh, and um, this particular painting brings up another theme of mine, which is difficult. I've always been kind of been working with the idea of how in painting can you suggest the passing of time? And I've just arrived at this idea of actually just being kind of literal about it and, and putting in these ancient statues, which of course you, you find all over Italy and in Rome. And, and I've spent a lot of time in Rome. And, and, and then I, I kind of like the idea of the way people congregate uh, in Italy or, or any, anywhere, the, the, uh, the kind of passeggiata or the the uh, taking a walk, you know, getting together and, and uh, just see and be seen 
And that's, that's kind of what this is all about. And again, I like to put a little bit of humor in there with the poodle. And I kind of thought that was humorous to me was to have the, the owner sitting on the fire hydrant. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that takes care of that one. So Anne, uh, are you there? Is Anne with us? I guess not yet. So I think we'll skip Anne until she gets here. I, I'm uh, here. Oh, you're here. Okay, great. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see you in the list. Hi. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm here with my, my whole family. <laughs> Uh, Aya just came on with me here. She's gonna, they're gonna go to the playground in a second, right? Are you getting ready to go to the playground? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Why don't you go get your coat on, okay? All right. Yeah, so my paintings are, um, well, oil on panel, uh, and I use graphite to, um, to, to draw them out, uh, initially, and, um, you can see traces of the graphite coming through, the, particularly there in the, uh, where the, the um, bricks are on the, the, the cobblestone on the pavement there. Uh, you might be able to see some of the graphite. It's hard to see the detail in the, <laughs> there's a lot of little detail. But um, yeah, and these, uh, I think my, all of the works that are included in the show uh, are, are funny because they're, you know, they they are narrative of sort of a sort, but they're none of them include people. And um, uh, I, <laughs> uh, none of them include actual people. But I think the idea that um, I'm after, or the feeling that I'm after, is the the narrative of uh, walking through a space or being in a space and being um, the evidence of the the people or the stories that uh, were there were uh are there but not necessarily um presently so yeah and i, I think it's interesting especially now with covid because you feel i didn't make these during covid but um i've always sort of kept my space from people <laughs> that's sort of my personality in a way i like to spend a lot of time alone um but i think now walking through spaces, especially in my town. I mean, we're, I live in a town where everyone's really good about keeping distance and wearing masks and everything. So they, it feels uh, familiar or something, how, what's the word? Um, <laughs> my, it feels like I'm walking in, within one of my own works <laughs> as I'm walking around these places. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause I mean, people are out, but you know, not, not in the same way. People are uh, distancing. It's definitely a depopulated feeling. Yeah. But also yeah. I mean, we're in the suburbs, so we're, I'm not in the city as much. And yeah, <laughs> that's the other thing that's strange. We, I mean, we haven't been to New York City in, you know, over a year. Um, and uh, well, no, I guess it's been under a year now. But um, still, it was almost a year ago that we were there, and that's weird. I mean, we, I, as much as I don't like being around people, I love going to New York. So it's very strange to. See. Not be able to um, yeah. <laughs> sort of get into these um, spaces That's where there is. In Portland. And this one is all graphite, is that? This is all graphite on panel, so it's a gesso panel. And um, yeah, hard to see the detail there, but yeah, it's, a, it's all graphite drawing. Yeah. The image at the bottom. It's just a shadow from somewhere. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the shadow. There is a shadow. Yeah. I'm sorry, can't see too, too well there. Yeah. That's good. Well, how come you're, some of them are full color and then some are graphic? What the... um, just to work in a different media. I think that um, I, I really love drawing. Um, I don't, I really, uh, you know what? I think that sometimes, uh, what, sorry, I wasn't, it's been a little while since I thought about these, but um, actually, as I was drawing out a lot of the paintings, what ended up happening was I was really falling in love with the paintings as drawings, and then it was sort of seemed sort uh, a little heartbreaking to then add the color, and you would you would it was not the same sensibility. Um, 
So I decided to see what it would feel like to just let some of the paintings be drawings onto themselves uh, on the panel. So this is the same exact style of panel that I would use for the painting, but without the pigment brought in. And some of the drawing of the painting uh, is as, I mean, a lot of it is as detailed as it is in this panel. Drawing, sorry. <laughs> Does that answer? It's beautiful. Well, thank you. Thank you, Anne. So next to Anne's work, there's a, we have a painting by Mikhail. Mikhail, would you like to speak about this piece? Oh, you're, you'll have to unmute Mik Mikhail. <laughs> I have to mute. Uh, okay. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, that piece is called um, Rescue. And um, it's actually based on a, a Caravaggio composition. Um, although <laughs> everything has been changed and the meanings have been um, sort of altered to reflect my own life. Um, about six years ago, I had like a sort of an unfortunate incident. And in the end, it all turned out okay. Um, it took a while, but the actual incident itself was an assault. And, um, but there were all of these people that came to my rescue. And so, um, which, um, you know, until today, I'll never forget that. And that is, so I wanted to make a painting. I was actually in a show that was coming up. I was still not well completely. And I just focused on not the actual um, incident, but more of just working to uh, get out of this space of the incident. And so that's where this painting came from. It's a I mostly work in acrylic now. I used to work in oil. I began to get concerned about solvents. So I uh, tried this and I also use other things like in my work like collage and oil. I will use oil, but I'm now trying to uh, use an oil on oil process uh, and, um, and skip the solvents altogether. Um, so that's pretty much the where this is. So do you have any difficulty getting the depth of tone with acrylic than you do with oil? Yes, I do. It, it was a hard process. The transition was really hard because uh, for me, when acrylic dries, it dries not necessarily the same color when it's wet. And, um, but eventually, like the one good thing is, is that medium, you know, by adding certain mediums, I can keep it wet for pretty long and I can still make changes. Um, also, um, I've now gotten used to it enough that I know the shifts, the color shifts and where it might go. And I always have a backup plan. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely hard with figurative work. When yeah, it, like, it's figurative. very hard. And I, I must admit, um, it's nothing like using oil for figurative work. Um, but you know, like out of every, I sort of believe like out of every um, sort of thing that we're dealt in terms of like, if we were for, if oil just disappeared and we were forced to work in acrylic, we would figure it out because we still are artists and want to make work. Or if there was another medium that we got used to and then no longer, we had the um, opportunity to use it, you'll figure it out. So that's where I am right now with uh, the acrylic. Now, I um, have lots of oil paints that I actually sort of like manipulate in with the acrylic. I use it as a top coat. I use, sometimes I just use the acrylic as a bottom and I'll work some of oils on top. But um, I mostly need to now, at this point, not use solvents. Thank you, Mikhail. You're welcome. <laughs> In this next batch here, we have two of Clarissa's pieces on the left. Clarissa, would you like to uh, speak about them, yourself, your process here? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Clarissa. And um, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk about these. These are um, actually from a show from uh, 2018. And these are the two smallest. It had a very big range in size. Um, the Most of the paintings from this show were much larger than these. In fact, one of them is uh, seven feet by five feet. Um, these, are, uh, these are all done in encaustic, which is tinted beeswax and oil. And the, the theme of this, uh, this was called the Grand Tour. And all of these paintings are taken from a found photo album uh, from a Roman uh, flea market. It was an open air market. And uh, this is a friend who passed it on. It was a gallery director friend. Um, and all of the images um, in this photo album. It was this beautiful tooled leather, perfect, you know, very well preserved photo album of an Italian woman's journey through Egypt and uh, Jerusalem. And all of these had these remarkable um, white ink, you know, captions in Italian. And it was this whole, you know, kind of death on the Nile era. It was from 1933. And it was all about her journey there, and it was seen through um, seen through the eyes of somebody who who had a vacation. You know, this was it was kind of a little culture clash, and it was just kind of fascinating for me to look through it. And um, most of my work is really heavily influenced by uh, by photography and vintage photography, and definitely film. Um, and I like the idea that this is kind of a visual, it's visual storytelling to me. And so when I found these, these photos, um, this was, it was kind of handed to me, this thing saying, you know, you might be interested in this. And of course I was. So it became kind of a big research project for me because there was a lot of um, backstory that I didn't know. So I, a lot of it had my own kind of, there was a lot of me filling in the blanks and so my story got kind of meshed with her story, you know, because there just wasn't enough information to find. I found information on the steamer that she came over on. I looked up the hotels that I was able to find. A lot of them are just kind of golden age of Egypt hotels that were well known at the time. But I never found out her name and I never found out a lot of the other kind of parts of her own backstory. I don't know if this was the kind of travel that she did typically, or if this was her once in a lifetime trip that she saved up for. But the images were so captivating to me uh, that I really wanted to choose some and kind of piece together my interpretation of her, of her story. Um, so yeah, and that's, there were a number of pieces from that and they all showed her kind of in different parts of her trip. So you so. work with encaustic. Yeah, um, encaustic, uh, uh, for those who don't know a lot about it, encaustic is tinted beeswax. Um, there are different kinds. There, there are other kinds of wax that are used, but typically it's beeswax. And it's usually made up of three parts, which is beeswax, pigment, and resin. So it has more of a, um, it's more uh, stable than if it were just wax. Uh, I make my own paint. I buy all the raw components and I make the paint. And what happens is you, it comes in a solid and you have to melt it um, on a hot plate or there are various ways to work with it. And uh, so you have to make it molten and then you can paint with it. And then once it's on the surface, it hardens immediately. So then you can go back into it with tooling it or with heat and so forth. And I use it in many, many transparent layers. I use a lot of, um, there's a lot of clear medium in there because I like, I like how quiet it makes it. I like kind of a desaturated palette. Um, I like the softness that wax can, can do. It's very atmospheric as a, uh, as a medium. And to me, in a project like this, um, wax is almost like a shorthand for layers of time. There, to me, there's something temporal about it. It's, um, 
it's kind of like a, a visual way of putting something back in time or as a memory or something. So to me, it's very fitting for a project like this. It's all the things that interest me about how to tell a story and um, where the interpretation is and where, you know, there's a lot of subjective nature to it. Yeah, the, so. the two things seem to mesh really well here, like the, nat the nature of the imagery and the and the acoustic uh, media. Thank you. I feel like it lends itself um, as as a medium. Um, you know, there also these are all you know black and white or or sepia photographs, and these are things that, you know, I was kind of making certain decisions with color and and so forth as I was kind of working on them. And excuse me, I realized how just how fitting this is for all the things I like. You know, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a helpful uh, set of tools for the particular language I'm going for, if that's a way to, if that makes sense. So I, I like that. I like the, the quiet, really, of wax, because I think it can really convey some things visually that maybe not, I don't know that I would find it as easy to do, let's say, with another medium um, quite the same way in a project like this. Oh. Thank you, Clarissa. Mm -hmm. So now we have another Barbara here. Barbara, would you like to speak about this piece? Yeah, this one, uh, this one is the only oil among my group uh, and the last oil painting that I, that I did probably in my studio that was outside of my home. I'm in my home studio right now. Um, this, this painting, um, Again, this reflects my time in in uh, Italy, and uh, we we stayed in a lot of small towns. Over the years, I've been there in various small towns, and sometimes you come across quite by accident a luck that the, these these uh, pageants are are going through the streets, and this this was one of them. I uh, I think it was in Orvieto, maybe. And uh, at the same time, I'm going to get rather personal about this one because um, I remember that we were staying in a, an apartment on, an, as part of a uh, castle there. And the, the owner, who happened to be an American, decided, oh, so she had a kind of a group of people at dinner after this procession later in the day, and she decided she would make this lemon meringue pie as a tribute to the Americans who were sitting at the dining table. <laughs> Unfortunately, the pie collapsed, but I thought that wasn't very nice to have a collapsed painting. But anyway, <laughs> the, other theme of, the other theme of this is um, the, the idea of being, being out of place, a foreigner, or somehow you're out of your element. And that's always true for anybody who finds themselves in a foreign country with a foreign language, even if it's familiar as it is to me, but it, you still always hold your own uh, uh, ego and, and uh, country inside of you. So, and I think I was pulling this, this all over as a stage presentation of some past experience. And, uh, and again, uh, just the last thing I'll mention is the idea of the passage of time again, because these natives, they get dressed up in their, their ancestors' costumes, you know, so they mm. present their history uh, as they go through their lives. So, so that's what that's all about. Barbara, are you working from drawings or photographs or? No, well, that's, no, I never work from photographs. I never learned how to do that. That seems to stop me in my tracks. All of these, I just consider that all of these folks are a cast of characters that live in my head. <laughs> so I don't ever have a model in front of me, but I draw from the model all the time. I have all of my, my artistic life. I always find a, a group to to uh, draw with and and I'll give a plug to the plastic club in Philadelphia where I go closed down right now because of COVID but I go there regularly to draw from the wonderful models who who uh, pose for us so 
there it is. And I also want to say one more thing. I so much enjoy hearing from the other artists here because I like probably most artists, you, you, you enjoy the piece, but you also are looking to see what can I learn from this piece that I can put into my own work. I'm always kind of curious about that. So, so thank you, fellow artists there. Yeah, the, if the artists have questions for each other, it would be yeah. interesting to hear that. Um, thanks, Barbara. Um, yeah. Right here, we have another uh, piece by Mikhail. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, a Shadow of My Former Self <laughs> is the title. <laughs> now, um, it's not necessarily me, but um, many of the um, paintings that I think that uh, are in this show are about um, my sort of uh, realization that the uh, world that I grew up in was not exactly what it appeared to be. And so in the last couple of years, I think like much of that was is new discovery. Um, I, as a kid, I was always a curious kid. I read a lot. I, um, you know, my parents got tired of me saying, why? Tell me more. So they bought me a, a you know, a, a bunch of encyclopedias. Well, now we, you know, and then from there you go to school and then I started to read and, you know, books and writers and all of that. But Ultimately, in the last couple of years, with all the things going on with the current political client, uh, climate and all of the protests and everything, I started to discover stories that I'd never heard before. And some of them were disturbing. Um, and um, I realized that I had never, I never learned any of that in school. So this piece is sort of based on the Jim Crow period of time. And it's, uh, you know, it's about the, the person who is, um, you know, uh, a, a person of color who is dancing on a stage or as long as he's doing like a sort of a tap dance with a happy smile, there are people that he can entertain. But the big question is, are they laughing with him or at him? And I see you have text. Uh... I do. And it's just uh, little snippets out of my mind about how this character might feel or what they might be thinking. I'm sorry. That's some background noise here. So I'll just ask everyone to please stay muted because we uh, pick up the, what's going on here. So thank you. Sorry, Mikhail. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. So anyway, that's uh, pretty much the whole story. It's a it's mixed media. Um, I used. Um, I have a collection of photographs. I decided not to paint it. I was sort of compelled by a photograph of an African American with a boater's paddle. And, and uh, I think I heard some feedback. Uh, and then I just uh, started to incorporate, there's a certain amount of my figurative work that's moving into a more um, abstraction of environment. So I sort of played around with the figure and, and threw a lot of paint around. That's great, thanks so much, Mikhail. And we actually have another one of yours coming up here next. So let me, I have to, to get out of the way here. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so this continues the the tale. Uh, this is, uh, you know, entitled, uh, uh, you know, uh, basically you you told me a story, and I think you're lying. <laughs> and it's basically um, a reflection of the idea that everything that I'd already learned, uh, all of these things that I had learned were actually not truths. They were at best half truths. Yeah. 
It's a pretty potent message. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, um, uh, for years I actually contained my, um, well, I had a different belief system. It, uh, the work was always about, I was thinking more of like metaphysics and, and how are, you know, using our, uh, which I still do, you know, uh, consciousness and sort of rising above and evolving and all of those things. And I think they're important, but I think now at this point, I, 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 in order for me to move forward, I have to address the past a little bit. And I'm already actually sort of um, more optimistic this year than last year, although we wouldn't know it from the last few year, a uh, few days. Now we're off to a rocky uh, start. Yes, but I'm optimistic that we're moving away from this other order. And uh, so, you know, I hope to get back to sort of feeling very like optimistic that the brings, you know, uh, new ideas, uh, better ideas, um, more, um, you know, let's talk about love as opposed to all of these other things, if possible. Uh, but I do think that we have to address them because if they've been ignored, uh, it's just like sweeping dirt under a rug. You're, it's going to eventually, you're going to need to clean it. So, so a bit of this is about that. <laughs> Thank you, Mikhail. You're welcome. So, Anne, we have another one of yours here. All right, let me, I'm, I'm not, I'm never quick to the draw with the mute and unmute, sorry. <laughs> well, I didn't say we're going to skip you this time, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, this, this piece is uh, really, it's a special piece. It's a piece, it's a portrait of my husband's um, grandmother's home in Japan. It's um, a very quiet uh, narrative. Uh, I, when we were there, and we, and this is, yeah, I actually am really happy that I ended up documenting her home. She lives in, or she lived in a traditional um, style of Japanese uh, house uh, in Nagano in Japan. And uh, we visited there my first trip to Japan with my husband, which was back in 2008. And uh, I, remember at the time just being so overwhelmed by how um it's just how it, well i was just very affected by her, her home because it reminded me a lot of my own grandmother's home and i never documented it she passed they passed away when i was a teenager and i just didn't have the wherewithal or i mean i'm sure there's documentation of their home but it just was a really special place for me uh, they were sort of uh, uh, well, extremely important people for me. So, anyway, I documented his her home for him just because I thought, you know, you never know, he might not come back. Uh, we we don't know about this family home if we'll have it. So uh, I did did this portrait of her, this little spot which was just full of um, you know mementos, things that her children had gotten her. Um, yeah, and it, yeah, it's just a special little portrait <laughs> of, of that space. And um, I'll never forget visiting there. Yeah. <laughs> the presentation is very interesting because you've got the, the oil on a panel. Is it panel? Yeah, it's one panel, yeah. Like under glass, like it's, a, you know, like a memento in a shadow box type, you know. Yeah. Is that, is that... Can you talk about that? I mean, like how you came to, to show it this way? Um, I think the thing for them is that because they're such small tiles almost, these, this, this size, the six by six, um, it, they get handled really roughly um, e or easily, uh, and, or it's easy to the, I don't know, it just gave it more presence um, and, and sort of showcased it in, in a more, uh, um, um, just in a, a, a sturdier way, I guess. Uh, I think that's more or less why I chose to start doing this with the smaller panels. Uh, and then I just really liked how it, um, yeah, how it framed it up a little bit. Uh, yeah, it definitely gives it presence. Yeah, yeah, because a small frame didn't work and I didn't really just like 
you know, Velcroing it to the wall or <laughs> whatever. It's just sort of hard to present such a small, and they're just simple panel, wood panels, you know, they're not, uh, there's not much, too much to them to, to hang them. Um, also, I, like if you try, uh, yeah, it was more the logistic of how do you hang this thing and not have it get lost on the wall and, um, and have presents. Because I want people, also because I work with such detail, there's a lot of small marks and small um, passages that um, I, I want people to, hey, like notice it to got, come in and peek inside and see what you can find. Mm. Ah, yes. Again, this is oil, oil on panel. Mm. That's great. Thank you, Anne. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so, Mikhail, we're coming up to two more heavy-duty pieces by you, <laughs> for sure. Oh, you'll have to unmute yourself. Okay. Um, well, it's entitled A Shady Promise, uh, part one, and A Shady Promise, part two. And uh, it's basically a continuation of my same exploration of history. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's about uh, what you can probably imagine, uh, enslavement and uh, have more enslavement. And then, and then you know, uh, it, it, the story moves forward, it's, uh, you know, there is the Emancipation Proclamation, but then there's a new sort of a different kind of enslavement. But that's pretty much those two talk about the antebellum South. Mm. Wow. Because, you know, with the way you handle the paint, you don't really notice at first, and then you start to look at it, and then the imagery starts to emerge. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it was intentional. I didn't actually want it to be too exactly in your face, although I have done others that were. Uh, but I, you know, these were smaller because I generally work and work bigger. And I, you know, I mean, I, I know that's still pretty, um, you know, pretty powerful, but I wanted it to be a little bit more muted in my head. So that's what I ended up with. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. So Clarissa, this is I think the largest piece of yours in the show. Your piece on the right. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, this one, um, actually for the show, this is the mid-size. This, this is the, uh, the median size of, of all of the pieces, but it's the largest one here. And um, yeah, this, this one, I don't know why I'm, I particularly like this one because they're, they're so, I don't know, they're just so joyful. They're on vacation, they're on, um, this is from a photograph of them posing on board the, um, the Arabic which was the name of the, the steamer they were on. And it was towards the end of the, the book, which I'm assuming is chronological. Um, I kind of mapped their, um, uh, their progress along the trip based on what I could find out. And, um, and it was just kind of a moment. She has a, a journal in her hand and gloves and she was you know, caught in the moment of writing probably what her thoughts were about what she's been experiencing. And it was the same cluster of people that she seemed to be traveling with in all of these, um, all of these photos. But this just had a, um, it just had a, a, a relaxed, um, a leisure to it, this particular photograph. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this one. Um, that's, I mean, there were hundreds of photos in there. And so really mining it for what I thought distilled the trip into a couple of, you know, kind of hero images. And this is one of them. This this one to me feels like um, the, the kind of the expansiveness of travel um, and 
Yeah, it's just it's a it's a happy photo. And when you um get dressed up to travel. What's it? When you used to get dressed up to travel. Oh, for sure. They all and if only people wore hats like this again, wouldn't that be something? That would be a world I want to live in. Um and they they did. They were, you know, they were dressed well. They were, you know, all the men had their you know, three-piece suits on and hats, regardless of whether they were in front of one of the ruins. Um, you know, they had furs on, they had all of this. So you could see she has a fur with her and she has gloves and so forth. And so, yeah, it's it's a different era. And it, it um, of course, I'm superimposing all of my ideas of what that would be like. And, you know, I would, I, I assume there's a slowness to travel then that is not really part of travel now and again it's all through my interpretation it doesn't mean that this is me filling in the blanks but but that's that's one of the things that really kind of captured me about about this series is um it's really transporting for me you know it's a it's a different world it's a different time anything to do with time travel and historical stuff i'm all over it because it's a um, it's an escape you know and uh, and I just, I came to really, really like these people in these photos. So it was really a joy to do this one. That's great. Thanks, Clarissa. Thanks. <laughs> so Barbara, you seem to have a travel theme here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. This could reflect some of what Clarissa said. Uh, I've just mentioned, in, uh, I often use a uh, water theme uh, because number one, I've spent lived a, num a, a number of years in the ocean, um, so I kind of like to give that. I mean, if you've ever lived at the ocean, you look out there, and it it it, it kind of uh, gives a I don't know a different kind of a meaning to your life that there there's there's a broad expanse out there, on unexperienced. Etc. But this this one is uh, called Resort, and uh, it too is acrylic. Uh, acrylic, by the way, is is a new thing for me, and I'm trying always to. I like it. I, I enjoy it because I make a lot of mistakes in paintings, and so with acrylic dries fast, and you can do something new on it. Uh, but the problem is you can't get a um, often a feeling of the depth of the paint, which somehow gives a depth to the meaning as well, but I'm working on that. Anyway, this is called Resort, and again, it's the theme of people being out of, out of their element, but uh, I kind of wanted to triangle them uh, as, as uh, those who are serving and those who are mm. served. And somebody having a word in there? Yeah, so, uh, and, and the ship out there on its way somewhere, which sort of maybe brings the, the, the immediate incident that is happening a little more uh, immediate. Uh, so k kind of that's, that's about it. But, but uh, uh, again, I guess it's about um, uh, strangers in a new place or, or in that in that vein, I kind of got a lot of things into that. I think, which which I prefer that the viewer decide what the painting is about instead of me deciding. Once it's out of my hands, you know, my baby is gone, and you can you can say about it what you will. So that's that's how I feel about it, and and so enjoying what everybody else has to say about their paintings. Learning a lot here. Thanks. Okay. There's an interesting dynamic here between the two foreground figures and the the figures in the, the background. They seem to yeah. they want to get in on the they seem to be having a happier than <laughs> the two at the table actually. Yeah, yeah. Well I think I was it's kind of emphasizing that that strange strangeness that that you often see in a resort it's a kind of a i'm not a resort person but i happen to have been uh, having lunch at this one and uh, 
that, that's just how it struck me, you know, that these folks are never quite at ease there. They're in a new place, but the servers are, are perfectly at ease. It's their place, really, I guess. And they've seen a thousand couples like this, I suppose. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> but I did want to emphasize how all are dependent on one another. You know, the triangle of, of uh, their interdependence, so to speak you want to call it that here okay it's great can I just say how much I love the gesture of your the gestures of your figures and I love the way you paint pieces I really am enjoying your paintings <laughs> oh, thank you so much Barbara yeah they're they're really beautiful and yeah thank the faces of these two figures in the foreground here wow they're just really yeah, yeah. gorgeous yeah, work I, I, I also wonder if I like to play around with skin color these days you know, we've got so many skin colors. Yeah. And sometimes if you're, if you're a Caucasian, you paint Caucasians all the time. But let's start mixing it up and get everybody into the yeah. act. In more ways than one. Yeah. <laughs> right. So that's, that's just another passing uh, thing that goes through my head so from time to time. Yeah. So, Anne, we have two more by you here. Excuse me, could I just interrupt one second and ask Barbara, do you have a character that you have repeated in a number of your paintings? Or uh, they're there, all... You mean, you mean specific, a specific person that I'm thinking of that I might know? Is no, I meant uh, once you created one of these wonderful figures, uh, do you find that, lo and behold, <laughs> they've cropped up into another one of your paintings? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure that happens. Over yes. years, I mean, I'm, I'm up in age here. So, so, do, you, so do you become, like, attached to them? Do they, you know... Uh, are... Well, you know, some people have seen my husband in every single painting that I ever do. So I don't mean it to be, but, uh, but there it is. But uh, yeah, they appear. It's it's just this cast of. I grew up in in Philadelphia, in South Philadelphia, in in just so many people around me, relatives living all around me. So I've always been around a lot of people, uh, kind of absorbing all these different personalities and and even body types uh, that that they just live in my head, and and I guess they find their, themselves. In there, I, sometimes I like to say, "Oh, hi, how are you?" You know, <laughs> nice to see you again. That's sweet. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, and the the painting here is very intense. Mm -hmm. and the color just uh, radiates. Um, it's quite an amazing piece. Thanks. Um, this was a combination of gardens <laughs> that I've come across and spent. One of the gardens is in my town here, uh, Lansdowne, uh, and it's um, I, I, some of the figures, the, the sculptures that are in the garden are from that, and it's this really elaborate front garden of a house <laughs> nearby <laughs> that I uh, walk past a lot. And then the other garden is one uh, at a residency that I spent some time at, uh, uh, and um, that the building it would would have been the the house that I would have stayed in um, at that time. And yeah, um, I just uh, wanted to pay tribute to a magical space that a a garden uh, alone in a garden can can be. <laughs> and evoke it in the painting. <laughs> and then up top we have a drawing. Yeah, that's a um, uh, train, uh, in a train uh, going to, uh, we we're going to Koyasan, which is a, um, it's not too far from Kyoto in Japan. And uh, it's a, a small village on top of uh, the mountain, in the mountains, that is where um, Buddhist monks had exiled 
um, during a time when they were persecuted. And um, so we were on our way there and it was so beautiful. Like the, the um, just watching the trees, like the different, the variations of the trees and the landscape as we were going there felt mystical. Uh, but then every, there were just a couple people on the train with us and they were on their iPhones and <laughs> not paying any attention. So they're sort of in this picture, just looking down, not really, not really seeing the sight. <laughs> and I thought, wow, pick up your heads, look outside. It's just amazing. <laughs> but yeah. but it, was a, it was also a quiet moment. So I think they were meditating in their own way too. <laughs> mm. So, Mikhail, we have another one of your pieces here. So, uh, this is titled, uh, The Day Shall Come When None of This Shall Matter. And uh, it's a definitely a mixed media. It's um, collage and paint. Uh, uh, I... Um, it's based on my belief that uh, everything that we're experiencing now is um, transitory. It, one day, it won't really matter at all. We'll, we'll, we'll wonder what it was all about, why we were upset. You know, we may know, we may still feel there was a reason to be upset, but in fact, it will pass. So that's what I kind of hold on to is that ideal that, the things that we're experiencing now, the things that create angst, the things that are, um, you know, uh, causing us great pain, one day it will pass. It might be, uh, it might take a while, but it will. So that's what that title is based on and the imagery. It's a very hopeful theme. So you framed this one a bit differently. You've used like more uh, power. I did. Um, part of it is happenstance with my framing. I don't always, you know, like um, I happen to be fortunate enough to have access from time to time to a few frames. And actually that would not have been the one that I thought would have worked, but for some reason I liked it together. So I went for it. Um, I, you know, generally a lot of times I don't show things framed or a minimal frame, and um, but it seemed to kind of work for some reason. Um, it had a bit of the, I forget what they call it, it's probably the fillet, uh, which is the inside sort of area, which gave it some depth. And uh, so I thought it made sense. You know, the, the rustic part of it is the part of it that I'm surprised that I actually like as much, but you know, I, th I thought it worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good combination. Yeah. Thank you. So, Barbara, you have a bit of a mythological bent here. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and that painting, yeah, do you want to hear about that one? Yes, yes. Okay. I, I'm just so interested in in how all of us are, are speaking about the thoughtful and serious nature of painting. You know, sometimes you, you it's, I've spoken to folks who think it, you know, you think it here and it comes right out your arm and that's the end of it. But, it, you know, it's, it is, you can hear it here. It's a thoughtful approach. But this one, this one is another one of my um, uh, idea of the threat of happiness. And I'm sorry to that these ladies are the um, the vixens again, as as uh, Adam and Eve, and through the ages, the poor women are always uh, stuck with that, often stuck with that label. But there they are, and I thought they looked pretty, all three of them lined up. And the theme here is that they are enticing the sailors to come to their. Uh, their death, their their end, whatever, uh, and I guess the the moral of the of this of this uh, ancient Greek myth is that uh, things 
that are lovely are not always so lovely that you they may have an underlying uh, evil intent uh, so um, so that there it is there's the my water theme there are my oh yes and, and this I will say because of COVID and I did do this in the past year or so I, I was without the models and I love doing nude figures you know getting that figure so I I was determined to see how I could paint some nude figures without the model in front of me. So that that takes care of a lot of a lot of ideas going on here, including the distance of the water. Again, oh, that's that's about that one. The end. So, Clarissa, we have an, uh, your piece here. It's. Uh, a bit different than the others with the vacant seat. Yes, this is, this is kind of, um, uh, this one is called uh, Verso L'Oriente. Um, all, all of the paintings are titled from her captions in the book, which were all in Italian. And this one was, um, I want to say this one was in Alexandria. I've forgotten all of the details of, of the trip, but this was from a hotel and it was, uh, it had this, you know, kind of gorgeous golden sun, um, sunlight in it. And it just, it just felt like an in-between moment, you know, um, most of what was in this album had to do with um, posing in front of tourist places and posing in front of well-known iconic stops along the way of a grand tour of Egypt. And uh, this one for me was, um, it felt like it was the, um, just the in-between moment, you know, as if it were away from the camera. Although of course it, it was, you know, it did make it onto, onto film. Um, but it, it kind of represented to me all of the um, letting your hair down, so to speak, taking your hat off in between all of those stops along the way. And um, since I, I kind of think in film terms, it's like the B-roll, you know, it's like an establishing shot. And um, it, just, it just felt like a very quiet, luxurious moment in a place I would like to be. And it, um, it feels as if since the album was, again, so many photographs of people, it felt significant to me that this was a moment that wasn't and it was unpeopled and it was um, just that, uh, that, little, that little in between. So it was kind of a significant one for me. It really stood out to me as one to be acknowledged, you know. Um, and the, the distance of it was really something. And I like that there's, there's very little sky there, but it's still, you could see this kind of quiet, um, hazy atmosphere, you know, of, of being so far, so far in the deep ground, but it's still, you're surrounded by mountains, which, you know, I'm in Philadelphia here. This is not my landscape. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's transporting to me to see something that is so different from my everyday view. Um, so these are, those are kind of all my thoughts about this one. That's why this was kind of a special one to me. Um, from this show. This was, this is the unpeopled one. And I'm, I'm really pleased that it was, uh, that it's in this show. I really, um, I feel fond of this one. So yeah, that's kind of what was going on here. Well, I mean, it's got the sense of in between moments, not just for travel, but just in our daily life when we're always mm. trying to do things. So it's the in between things that you know, are sort of magical sometimes. Yeah, it does. It feels it. It feels as if it can act as a reminder that those those moments are, um, you know, mundane and um, and thrilling and important and wonderful and boring and all of that at the same time. And but they're they're there to be acknowledged, you know, if we, if we remember to. So that's a little bit of a takeaway for me is that it's, uh, it's worth noticing them, you know. Definitely. Thanks, Clarissa. Yeah. 
So, and we have one more. Sorry about the glare here. Um, but uh, this one has a cat in it. There's two cats. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, this one is. Uh, oh. Actually, uh, they're all they're all sort of um, obviously. You heard, you know what I've said about everything. They're all personal, and based on my personal experience, and um, I think. Uh, it was Barbara that said, you know, you can take away whatever <laughs> you find within it. But at the time that I did this, um, uh, my grandmother had lost uh, my grandfather. And, um, and uh, so it's, the, it's entitled Moon Glow. They, you know, the jazz music was a big uh, part of their life together. But um, they, uh, yeah. Uh, the feeling of, of her losing him and then us eventually losing her to dementia pretty quickly actually after that um, and, uh, <laughs> uh, also graphite on paper um, a lot of times I just kind of geek out on things that I'm interested in um, the, the village uh, which I think is um, I don't remember what I used as reference for that village in the background uh, all of my pieces uh, are taken mostly from uh, pictures that I've taken uh, as I travel around the world. Um, and I've spent uh, some time in, but I think actually this was, oh man, I'm so sorry. It's been a little while since I made this one. I can't remember where that was from. Uh, but uh, a, lot of, a lot in Europe and Germany okay. and Japan as well. Uh, and then also, uh, I think that the, that's might be from, I want to say um, Winterthur, <laughs> locally, uh, not too far from here. So uh, yeah, I kind of pull things from all over and pull them together to create my own world. So a lot of times the the uh, environments will exist somewhere, but not as I depict them. They're more of a um, a created space, invented space. Yeah, and those are my two, our two cat, two of our cats <laughs> who posed for me. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Thank you. So now I, you know, we like to open the floor to questions from the audience to the artists, the artists to each other. You'll have to unmute yourself if you want to venture forth. Um, hi, I'm Tony Oliva from New York City. Um, I have a question for the artist who painted the antebellum piece. I guess his name is Mikhail. Yes. Okay, um, just let me see if I can bring you up so I can see you when I ask you. So, so my question is, when you could, could you bring the painting in? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, so, so my question is, so, so did you have the concept in mind first? Like, did you, did you say to yourself, um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do a piece about the antebellum South and then, uh, how do you, de I'm interested yeah. in the process of how you decided what image, images to create and. Yeah. It's you, yes. It started with drawings. Uh, mm -hmm. And the drawings were uh, meant to be about the antebellum South. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been doing a lot of reading about uh, that period of time. And I, uh, I've done a whole body of work that um, sort of uh, addresses the, the, the passage from, you know, Africa to the States. Mm -hmm. And then all of the different uh, transactions that happened in the process. So this particular piece is much more, it's smaller than I usually work. Um, and so I felt that it needed a different treatment than say some of the bigger ones. But uh, it's a bit more, there's a bit more sort of abstraction involved. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Yeah. Uh... And then, and then the other piece you did uh, when we were talking about, you know, this too shall pass. 
Yeah. I was try I was trying to see like how those images like relate to you know, like the, the transitory yep. nature of our of our emotions. Okay. Um, well Okay, continue. <laughs> yeah, so you, you know, like like I don't know if I see the same thing that you mentioned, you know, in the painting. Yeah, I, and I, I could understand that. Uh, you know, uh, much of art is interpretive and in my case, a lot of things are based on dreams and, and journaling. And uh -huh. so in this particular image, it's part improvisational, but I had a dream where the central figure really wasn't, uh, uh, this is a basically a nude woman uh, that is, is from one of my sketches, one of my sketchbooks. Uh -huh. And uh, in the original composition, it was probably myself, but I didn't actually want to really want to do a self-portrait of myself in a similar space because the dream actually, I think, looks very much like the environment around this, this figure. Mm -hmm. But I felt that as I, it was a last, it was not a last minute choice, but this, the figure that I chose, which was from my um, earlier sketch, uh, seemed to make more sense to me uh, to convey the idea. I see. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions for any yes. other artists? Hi, it's Christine Stoughton. I have a question for Anne. Um, I, I got to see, I was able to see the show in person and I, I highly recommend that if you can get in to see it in person, it's, it's well worth your visit. Everything is um, quite engaging and it really draws you in. My question for Anne is I noticed how very quiet everything is in your work and how you can't see any brush strokes. So I was wondering how you accomplish that. Like your surface is so smooth that you work on. I, I was just wondering your technique for keeping the brush strokes at such a minimal. Ah, um, good question. Um, maybe, uh, I think that well okay I think that part of it is maybe the way that I apply the paint um a lot of times uh, especially in the areas where you definitely don't see too much brush stroke uh maybe you see more of like a glow what I do is I put the pigment down and because I do get a really smooth um um Panel. So I definitely uh, will gesso and sand, gesso and sand, and really get it like super smooth. I, I like it like that. Um, and then what I do is I, I kind of move the paint around. Oh, can I, you can hear me, correct? Sorry. Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Sorry. Uh, I just want to make sure I wasn't on mute. Um, so I, I move the, uh, the paint around with my, with my brush. Um, but I do use brushes uh, and, uh, and I'll just I sort of like, uh, yeah, just kind of uh, manipulate it around uh, to create the glow that I want. And then I sort of work around it with another pigment. Um, and uh, if, I mean, if you get in there, you, sh you should be able to see some brush stroke. Like certain areas I, you know, try to deliberately make um, more brushy or uh, give evidence. And then some areas I think I'm, I'm really after like a glow uh, that, that comes through with the paint. Yeah, so, uh, and I also take, I, I, I remove a lot of paint as well as I go. So I'll go in mm -hmm. with, um, with a little, like a, I'll put, um, the only time I really use, uh, I'll either use a little bit of oil. I don't use a whole lot of, um, uh, uh, I'm so sorry, <laughs> my brain's not working today. Uh, I don't use uh, spirits as much anymore, but I will use it to go in and pull paint out when I want it to get back to, like if I, like I'll pull the little leaves out uh, yeah, that's that's one way that I, you know, get rid of paint. Um, but, uh, but and yeah. do you do you sometimes go back in on top and add graphite, or is the graphite all coming from always underneath? I don't usually it's add all underneath. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's all underneath. Yeah. All right. 
Unless I never, unless I don't come, you know, yeah, it's all underneath unless I've never put paint in that spot before. You know what I mean? If I've not put paint in that spot, then it's pure graphite, but most, okay. most every place gets hit with paint by the end of it. <laughs> Great, thank you. Oh, of course, thank you for the question. So, Anne, when you work on these, do you work on them all the way through or do you pick them up and put them down and with drying time in between? Um, I, I work on them. Usually I, I try to work multiple pieces at the same time, but I end up getting sucked into whatever I'm working on. I'm just, that's how my, that's how I am. My, my tension just gets like really, I get really focused on that particular painting. So I end up seeing it through. Um, I think I would be more, you know, uh, productive, prolific if I were able to work on multiple pieces at once. But yeah, I just, um, so um, yeah, I, I work uh, as I go. I mean, I, I don't really think about, sometimes I have to think about letting it dry, uh, but usually I just am too impatient for that. So I just keep going and like, do what I want it to do. <laughs> but I, I don't think I could achieve this in acrylic. I, I know we're talking, you know, we've talked about that. A couple people have mentioned it. Um, throughout this chat. Um, yeah, I don't know if I, I I've never been able to, uh, to work with acrylic uh, because this uh, oil is just so much more forgiving. Uh, you can really, you know, you've got some time with it. Thanks, Anne. Thank you. So how about you, Clarissa? Do you work on your things individually or are you working on a batch at the same time, like given your technique and you're muted? I should know this by now. Um, yeah, I. Um, it's interesting. I've I've actually taken a step away from working in encaustic lately. I've been uh, working in oil again, which has been really a nice breather, actually, because it's a lot less process oriented. I mean, it is in terms of what you paint, but um, just kind of logistically and, and material wise, it's different. So when I was working on the, actually most of the time I would work in batches and I found that this particular show, the Grand Tour was very specifically a group. It was, it was something that was all related. And so I found it helpful to just be in the mindset of this project, of this woman, of this trip, of these, of these images. Um, However, and the other thing about that is that it was um, helpful for me to get away from a painting every now and then and move over to something else. So I, it keeps everyone from being so precious that I ruin it and I make myself crazy. So I think that having a little bit of a bird's eye view is a really helpful part of it for me. And by working in batches, that kind of enables that a little bit more. Uh, now I'm a little bit more... Um, I have a few things in process in varying degrees, but now I tend to kind of spend a little more time in each one. So it seems like it's evolving that way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, Clarissa, can you talk a little bit about how you've made color decisions in your painting since um, your reference point is really um, sepia photographs, tiny sepia photo photographs. I'm curious yeah. about your colors. Are they symbolic? Uh, is it, do you feel your way through your choices? You know, I, um, thank you for the question. I, um, in this one, this really was kind of a Ted Turner colorized, you know, black and white movie kind of process um, in a way, which is kind of fitting for me um, because I, I do kind of think that way. Um, there are a couple of things that come into account for me with color. Um, one is that it, it's just visually, I, I like something that's kind of quiet and soft and, and, and muted. It feels appropriate for putting it back in time you know, if this were really high key and really prismatic, to me that would be so jarring and, and modern that it, it would disrupt how I'm seeing it through the filter of time. So that's part of it on this. Secondly, um, in this particular show, uh, again, I was trying to learn what I could about this woman, but I don't know who she is. I, I gather that she was in mourning. Most of what she had on now this is 1933, most of what she had on was dark 
and in all of the photos. Now, I couldn't see what color dark, but it made me wonder if, um, if this was something where it was that she was in mourning and it was reflected in what she wore because most of her wardrobe was somber. And so from that, um, that kind of made me usually choose kind of gray or purple or which would have been kind of half mourning colors as well, which is kind of another interest of mine. Um, so I think there are some, some uh, little clues that I would take and I would try and interpret it how I could. And then the colors that I choose are just colors I like beyond that. You know, I, I like, um, yeah, I like this kind of palette and I, I gravitate towards it anyway. And then I try and adapt it for whatever it is I'm trying to say symbolically if I can. So I, I think they're very effective. And I really feel this one and also the, the empty chair on the balcony um, really does that thing where you're painting um, captured atmosphere, mm -hmm. um, which is really difficult. It's a, a very intangible, hard thing to achieve in painting. I think you've done it really well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, really. So any other questions for anybody? Jennifer Larson, I think. Yeah, you, uh, you can unmute yourself. Tap to speak, yes. I had to look for the tap to speak button. I'm on my phone. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of things. First of all, I think this is great. This whole talk, there's so many different um, techniques and I appreciate being able to look at something and to hear about the techniques and to hear about some of the thoughts behind. I know it's to look at something um, is, you know, you're having a personal experience in looking at something, but I also appreciate hearing what leads to it, what's important to the artist, and I really appreciate you putting this together. Um, and so many different techniques, right? So many different um, styles and Clarissa, when you were talking, um, I'm Clarissa's sister, by the way. I'm um, big fan too. Uh, when you're talking, I was, I was thinking when you were talking about the temporal nature of the encaustic layers, I thought, well, and you're talking about that's kind of like memory. It is like memory because some things come through sharply and other things are just faded and you just can't quite grasp it. So I thought, I never thought of it that way, the, the, the layers being um manipulating time like you're visually manipulating time and i thought that was really interesting and um i really appreciated hearing from the other artists but mikhail i you're i just love your work it's so stylistically it it has such an impact and then to look closer on me and to look closer and to get the context and the subject matter is like another wave of impact and yeah. so in in those two ways because often i'll see something and and um you know artwork doesn't like i'll have one or the other experience but your work has both of those powerful impacts and i just want to tell you how much i appreciated hearing about it and seeing it and um mm. look forward to seeing more um Thank you so much yeah, it really is something, and it's very interesting to, to think of all the different, um, how this show hangs together, uh, you know, different, different personal experiences in the subjects, right? In the, um, the subject matter of the uh, wait staff versus the vacationers, and this woman on a ship where everything's formal, and you know, antebellum South, where an experience is completely different. So this show is really, it's really an amazing uh, compilation. So thank you, Mike and Tina. That's all I wanted thank to say. You. Yay, you. you guys, yeah. <laughs> well, we're very grateful for the artists for uh, participating. It's, it's a real wonderful show. It's been a big boost for us, definitely, to spend time with the work, you know, and hang it and arrange it and, uh, feel it so um i'd like to thank all the artists and i think like to thank you for coming today 
And uh, I put the uh, link to the website in the chat. You can go there and see all the work uh, online. Every, all the information's there. And you can also come and visit us Wednesday through Sunday. And uh, thanks again and have a great, great weekend. Thank you, Michael. Thanks so much for hosting us. Thank you for a wonderful show. Yes. Nice to meet all the art. You're very welcome. We got to stick Thank together. You. Thank you. It's lovely. <laughs> Thanks. Have a good day and be safe, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.